Today I'm going to do a little review of this paper called The Quantum Field of a Magnet Shown by a Nanomagnetic Ferrell Lens. Uh, it was written by Emmanuel Markalakis from Greece and it was published in Magnetism and Magnetic Materials Journal in uh, April of 2018. This was originally supposed to be a video about the block wall and the misconceptions surrounding the term block wall, which has a very clear definition. So uh, the term block wall has been um, used incorrectly, uh, previ is being used incorrectly by some independent researchers, including myself. I am guilty of misusing uh, the term block wall in some of my videos, and so I, f I feel the need to set the record straight. So we are going to address the block wall uh, through the, um, the review of this paper because uh, Emmanuel uses the term block wall in this paper. The purpose of this review is actually twofold because um, I want to also talk a little bit about peer review. Now, obviously, this paper was published in a, I'm going to say, a relatively uh, prestigious uh, journal, a journal that, you know, I might want to publish a paper in. Um, and so I think some people have misconceptions about peer review. Now, just because something gets passed in peer review does not mean that the information in the paper is accurate and correct. Okay, things can get past peer review Incorrect things can get past peer review um, under the right circumstances, okay? So there are some things that are incorrect or misstated or maybe overstated in this paper, and yet it's still past peer review. So, um, so you know, I've had people tell me, oh, my paper passed peer review, therefore what I'm saying is true. That is not true. That is not the case. And so uh, that is also partly why I am making this video. So we're going to start here with the abstract. It has been more than 200 years since the first iron filings experiment showing us the 2D macroscopic magnet imprint of a field of a permanent magnet. However, the latest, latest developments in modern nanomagnetic passive direct observation devices reveal in real time and color a more intriguing 3D dynamic and detailed image of the field of a magnet with surprising new findings that can change our perspective for dipole magnetism forever and lead to new research. Okay, this research is a continuation of our previous work, which they just talk about right here. And then they say, um, we are presenting experimental and photographic evidence demonstrating the true complex 3D Euclidean geometry of the quantum field of, a permanent, of permanent magnets that have never been seen before and the, classic, um, and the classic iron filings experiment, apart from the 2D limitations, fails to depict. Okay, so they're saying that they are going to d be displaying something that uh, the iron file, the 2D iron filings fail to uh, depict. An analysis of why and what these iron filings inherent limitations are, giving us an incomplete and also to some degree misguiding image of the magnetic field of a magnet is carried out. Whereas as we prove, as we prove, that's a very strong word, um, as you demonstrate, maybe not prove, the ferro lens is free of these limitations and its far more advanced visualization capability is allowing us to show the quantum image. There, he's claiming to show a quantum image with depth of field information of the dipole field of a permanent magnet. So he is claiming that the ferro lens is showing um, the dipole field of a permanent magnet. Now we I already know that this is not true. Uh, I can already prove that this is not true, but this is what he's claiming in his paper. So, and then he goes on to say, for the first time, the domain wall, the block wall, or kneel wall, I don't actually know how to say that word, the kneel wall region of the field of a magnet is clearly made visible by the ferro lens along with 
uh, what phenomenon is actually taking place there, leading to an inescapable conclusion, novel observation and experimental evidence that the field of any dipole magnet actually consists of two distinct and separate toroidal shaped 3D magnet bubbles each located at either side of the dipole around the exact spatial regions where the two poles of the magnet reside. Okay, so that is the claims that Emmanuel is making in this paper. Introduction. We are using the same fair lens device introduced and described by us in our previous research to show the actual 3D geometry of the dipole field of a magnet of permanent magnets and as such for any other dipole static magnetic field since the geometry of, ma of magnetics dipole magnetic field does not depend or change with the shape of the magnet. Their field is uniform and remains geometrically the same for all dipole magnets. And very little research has been carried out so far by the um, about the topic of a 3D field geometry of a permanent magnet of permanent magnets and they all rely and are based on the old 2D iron filings, mac macroscopic experiment, imprint of the field shown in figure one. Okay, so um, basically what Emmanuel is saying here is that in 200 years, um, we have been relying on a 2D uh, iron filings experiments for our understanding of, um, of magnetic fields. Now here's the thing, okay, the reason we use 2D iron filings, the reason that iron filings are always presented like this in the literature is because paper, okay, this paper that he printed this picture on is 2D, okay, uh, just because iron filings are always displayed in 2D and they're displayed in 2D because all papers from history are two-dimensional, papers two-dimensional, and even if we had a 3D model of this, we could only ever present one slice of it um, in, in, uh, in 2D uh, to get an accurate depiction of magnetic field. So here I'm going to show you, here is a 3D video, here is a 3D video uh, a 3D model, not a 3D model, an actual 3D um, ma um, magnetic uh, iron filing. So there, this is a box with a whole bunch of um, iron filings in it. This is 3D, not 2D. Yes, it's still going to look 2D because we are still projecting onto a screen and you're only ever going to see one 2D projection at a time in your eyes. But here you can see he's turning it around. This is 3D. This is a 3D iron filing um, toy. Okay, this is a 3D iron filing toy, uh, which anyone could make. I could make one, you could make one. All you have to do is take, get a, a tube. I actually wish this was a cylinder instead of a square because you would get a better idea of how this thing is 3D. Um, let me just go back to this part here where he turns it around and uh, you can see, um, where did he do that? Let's just see, somewhere around here. I think he turns it around. There we go. So you can see, you can look at it from this end and you can see that it is not two-dimensional. This is a three-dimensional model of a uh, the iron filings. Not a 3D model, it is a 3D experiment of iron filings. So iron filings depicted as 2D, uh, historically depicted as 2D, um, is, is, not, um, is not because we haven't figured out how to do it in 3D yet. Obviously we can do it in 3D. It's just not convenient. This is, uh, 2D iron filings was, you know, is something that we teach our children. We show, we take a piece of paper and we put a iron filings on it and we put a magnet under it and we can show them magnetic field lines. This is something any kindergarten kid could do and this is why this uh, depiction of iron filings is so popular. So here I am in Google. I typed in 3D magnetic field and you can see that a, a lot of work has been done 
to uh, represent magnetic fields in 3D. So ma representing magnetic fields in 3D is not a problem. It is not, um, it has not been ignored. It has not been, um, we are not limited to visualizing magnetic fields in 2D. 2D is convenient, uh, but this is not. Obviously there are, there's a lot of work. A lot of work has been done. If you do just a quick liter literature search, here you see there's the, the uh, 3D magnetic field of the Earth they're trying to depict here. And uh, here is a nice 3D uh, rendering. Yeah, it's 2D because it's projected onto the screen, but it is in fact 3D. Uh, here's 3D, here's 3D. So, um, so the statement that Emmanuel makes about um, so very little research has been carried out so far about the topic of 3D field geometry of permanent magnets is patently not true. Okay, so then he goes on to say, however, uh, let's put the picture there. However, this picture of iron filings, besides their apparent 2D limitation, now obviously there's no limitation, it doesn't have to be 2D, uh, for depicting the field is due to their strong ferromagnetism, ferromagnetism size and their magnetic interference, lacking the fine tuning sensitivity and resolution required to depict the very important details of a static magnetic dipole field. Moreover, they are not suitable for use in the actual 3D visualization of the field, uh, which is, again, not true because here is a video of iron filings in 3D and iron filings themselves are not limited to 2D obviously um, as Emmanuel is claiming in his paper. Then he goes on to say for example the very uh, low near zero magnetic reluctance of iron filings will cause them to actually behave more like a compass needle. They always orient themselves relative to their position towards the highest potential regions of the dipole static, ma uh, mag static field, namely the two poles of the magnet. Therefore, the to uh, they totally, oh, I think there's a typo there. Therefore, they totally miss to show, that's kind of a weird way of wording it, therefore they totally um, miss to show what is actually happening to the mag magnetic flux tangent to the um, field force vectors near the block wall. Okay, the block or preferably Neely domain wall region at the middle of the permanent magnet. So this is where we're going to um, start talking about the block wall because it is uh, AB as AB has um, set me straight on this point, is the middle of the magnet, middle of the permanent magnet is not a block wall, nor is it a kneel wall, nor is it a domain wall. It is none of these things, and this is what we are going to talk about next. So I just want to finish this statement here. So important clarification from here on, when referring to the block region, we are referring to the field area of a magnet, which is near and around um, to its block domain wall, figure one, which is a number of atoms thick, around 100 nanometers. I'm not sure how he comes up with that number, but uh, basically he is talking about, um, he is talking about this. So when you look at a magnet uh, using a magnetic uh, viewing film, you discover that there is this sort of white region down the middle of the magnet. When you put a magnetic viewing film over a magnet, um, you can tell where the middle of the magnet is um, and that you know north is on one side and south is on the other side and vice versa, depending on how this magnet is oriented. And so there definitely is, you definitely can tell where the middle of the magnet is using magnetic viewing film. Now in his abstract, he said, uh, we can see that he can see this region uh, for the first time using a ferrocell, but that is actually, that was a misstatement, I believe in his abstract, because clearly the magnetic viewing film can show that region of the magnet as well. Um, and so he says here, 
in so this in this figure he says the block wall region of a ferrite ring magnet side this is a side view as shown by a magnetic field viewer at the middle of the magnet as a light green um, strip dark areas left and right are the two poles uh, of the uh, magnetized magnet and so this is a pole and this is a pole so that is correct uh, what is not correct is this is not a block wall it is not a domain wall it is not a kneel wall it is merely the center of a magnet and this is what I'm going to show you uh, by definition okay this is not I'm not making this up AB didn't make this up by definition, this is not a block wall. So the first thing I do when I want to try to understand a concept is I, I look up the definition of a term. Okay, so in magnetism, a domain wall, so domain wall is sort of the generalization of the block wall and the kneel wall, and there's all kinds of other um, configurations of uh, these kinds of walls. So in magnetism, a domain wall is an interface separating magnetic domains. Okay, so what is a magnetic domain? A ma magnetic domain is a region within a mag magnetic material in which the magnetization is in a uniform direction. This means that the individual magnetic moments of the atoms are aligned with one another and they point in the same direction. Okay, so... So here is a slide that AB Science made up for me to explain uh, domain walls to me. So uh, what basically what the definition is saying is domain walls, sorry, domains are regions, magnetic domains are regions where the magnetic moments are all pointing in the same direction. So this is a domain, this is a domain, this is a domain, this is a domain, and... Um, in uh, the um, in this Wikipedia page, they show um, a mic a microscopic uh, slide of a magnetic material with lots of magnetic domains. And so, um, basically, uh, this is magnetic domains are when the arrows are all pointing in the same direction. Okay, in a domain wall is the line that separates, is a region that separates uh, these domains, okay? So, um, and this has to happen within the material, okay? Within the magnetic material, within the inner atomic um, material of the object, um, this is uh, how the uh, magnetic domains appear. Okay, so in magnetism, a domain wall is an interface separating magnetic domains, and magnetic domains are regions of the material where the, um, where the magnetic moments are pointing in the same direction. The domain wall is a transition between different magnetic moments and usually undergoes an angular displacement of 90 or 180 degrees. A domain wall is a gradual reorientation of individual moments across a finite distance. Okay, and uh, it is on average between 100 and 150 atoms. So that is where uh, Emmanuel got the, this number from. Um, the uh, thickness of this wall is 100 and between 100 and 150 atoms in an actual domain wall. So on the right here, you can see a little depiction of um, this gradual change. So let's pretend that this is the, uh, the magnet, the material. And up here, you have all the domains pointing to the right. And down here, you have all the domains, uh, point, all the magnetic moments pointing to the left. So this would be one domain. This would be one domain. And the transition between this domain and this domain would be a gradual um, flipping of the magnetic moments from pointing to the right to pointing to the left. And so in order to have this kind of transition between uh, magnetic domains, you have to have magnetic, magnetic domains that point in opposite directions within the material, within the magnetic material. 
Okay, so um, so what I'm going to show you next uh, is going to prove that a there is no domain wall in a permanent magnet. So let's go back to this figure that I got from AB Science. And again, just to be clear, uh, a magnetic domain is uh, our regions within the material of the magnet where the magnetic moments point in the same direction. So this is a domain, this is a domain, this is a domain, this is a domain. And the domain wall is uh, the, the region um, between domains where the... Um, the magnetic moments would have to gradually change to this orientation, to the different orientations um, within, the, within the magnet. So this is a domain, this is a domain, this is a domain wall. This is a domain, this is a domain, this is a domain wall. So here is a uh, depiction of a permanent magnet. Now in a permanent magnet, in a, a saturated material, a permanent magnet, um, the, uh, most of the magnetic moments in the material are pointing in the same direction. So, uh, this would be, um, north and this would be south if this was a permanent magnet. Okay, so here <clears throat> you can see that since all the magnetic moments are pointing in the same direction, there can be no domain wall by definition of the term domain wall. Okay, there is no domain wall in the permanent magnet because within the, the inner atomic, within the material of the magnet, and this is the important distinction, this is where I was going wrong because I was seeing these arrows as streamlines of the magnetic field and not magnetic moments of the uh, material of the permanent magnet. And so this is where uh, AB was able to set me straight. I was mistaking these arrows for streamlines and they aren't these arrows correspond to the orientations of the magnetic moments within the magnetic material so clearly you can see there are no domain walls in a permanent magnet by definition of the term domain wall of course there are different kinds of domain walls the block the block wall is one kind of domain wall and the uh, Neal wall is another kind of domain wall. And so what is the difference between a block wall and a uh, domain wall? Well, here I'm showing you, let me just move this over, get it in the field of view. Um, so the top one here, A, this is an example of a block wall where the transition is from uh, is there's a 180 degree transition where the arrows are pointing up and the arrows are pointing down and the transition is kind of uh, is out of plane so the transition is going coming towards and uh, moving down so this is the definition of a block wall and a nihil wall um, has the arrows uh, the arrows as well are going from pointing up to pointing down only the transition is is in a plane so for the block wall the transition is sort of in a sort of a circular out of plane transition and the nihil wall is a kind of a, is more of an in plane transition from the um, magnetic mo moments pointing up to the magnetic moments pointing down so these are the definitions of the two walls which uh, Emmanuel mentions in his paper and the permanent magnet, okay, the permanent magnet is none of the above. Okay, the permanent magnet is neither, has neither a block wall nor a kneel wall because both block walls and kneel walls require a 180 degree um, rotation of the magnetic moments. So if the, so, um, here are a few examples of if the permanent magnet, if there were a domain wall in a permanent magnet, then some of the mag magnetic moments have to be pointing this way and the other magnetic moments have to be pointing the other way. They need to be 180 degrees out of phase with each other. And so here's another example. Uh, they could be pointing out and pointing out and there has to be a 180 degrees um, uh, tr transition zone 
um, within the atomic, within the permanent magnet of the material of the permanent magnet. And, uh, but that is not the case of permanent magnet in a saturated permanent magnet. All the domains are pointing in the same direction. And so uh, there is clearly no domain wall. There's no block wall. There's no nail wall in a permanent magnet. So this is what I mean when I say uh, peer review, just because you get a paper peer reviewed does not mean that the information in that paper is accurate or correct. In the case of the block wall here in the, in the paper, Emmanuel is clearly calling the middle of the magnet a block wall. He says it right here, the block wall region of the ring magnet. Um, the middle of the magnet is this uh, light green line right here. And this is uh, provably false. This is incorrect. This is by definition not true by the definition of the term block wall. Um, this is definitely not a block wall. And so uh, I think it's really important to understand that uh, when you read a paper and you're reading something uh, just because it made it through peer review does not mean that the information is correct. That somehow they got this past peer review in a journal, um, in the uh, magnetic journal, the, what's it called, the Magnetism and Magnetic Materials Journal accepted this paper, even though this paper had a huge flaw in uh, calling this a block wall when it clearly is not a block wall. So this calls into question everything else that is uh, described in this paper. So here you can see he's showing the picture of a ferro lens of a ferro cell with the lights on the outside and he is labeling the this part of the magnet, the middle of the magnet, as a block domain wall. And by definition, uh, the middle of a magnet is not a block domain wall. So this is a huge misunderstanding, which calls into question all of the other um, uh, claims that are made in this paper. So let's have a look here and see what he uh, is saying about this figure. Okay, so uh, the quantum field of a magnet shown by a ferro lens as two geometrical vortices, so he's calling these uh, vortices, so he's basically taking on Ken Wheeler's language here, uh, at either uh, pole of the magnet, um, oriented back to back and touching at the middle of the magnet, where the block domain wall uh, appears. So, you know, he's calling this a block wall. Yes, it's the middle of the magnet, but it is not a block domain wall. Okay, so... Um, and so he goes on to say a strong cube magnet is placed under the ferro lens at a small distance and therefore its body becomes effectively invisible. So that's interesting because he doesn't really explain why it becomes visible. He says the magnet is placed under the ferro lens at a small distance, therefore its body becomes effectively invisible and not shown by the ferro lens. So the therefore there, uh, this doesn't belong there. I'm not really sure why he's saying that. He's not really explaining why the cube magnet disappears. But anyways, that's a, that's a moot point. So only its field image is projected. Okay, so he, now he's claiming that the this is a field image. This is not a field image. Okay, this, uh, uh, as demonstrated by the software that AB developed to uh, simulate the ferro cell, um, clearly, uh, we can demonstrate that this is not um, the field lines directly, but this is an indirect view of the field lines um, that uh, are causing the nanoparticles in the ferrofluid to line up in such a way uh, that the lights reflect off of them and produce this pattern. So this is another mistake in the video that made it through peer review. Um, this is not a block wall, this is not a domain wall, and these are not field lines directly. This is not the image of the magnetic field. Okay, so then he goes on to say, um, the, the photo is doing injustice in showing the real depth of field information actually displayed by the ferro lens. Okay, so now he's saying that there is a 3D field of view, and this is uh, what I talked about in a previous video, and, uh, and anyone 
should be able to demonstrate this. If you have a ferro lens, if you have a ferro cell and you're looking at it directly with your two eyes open, you're going to see uh, something that looks kind of holographic. It looks kind of 3D-ish, um, very 3D when it's in real life. And pictures don't do it justice. And the reason pictures don't do it justice is because cameras only have one eye. The reason you get this depth of field um, image, this depth of field perception, and it's really just a perception, it's a, an optical illusion, is because you have two eyes and your eyes are separated by a distance and the light is coming into your eyes from different directions, from slightly different directions because your eyes have a separated by a distance and it gives a 3D effect. It is just a 3D effect and that effect pretty much goes away when you close one eye. And so anyone out there that has a ferrocell can prove this to themselves that um, the 3D effect pretty much goes away uh, when you close one eye. And of course, a camera only has one eye. Most of our, the cameras that you would have that I have only have one lens. They only have one eye. And so when you take a picture of a ferro lens, the, that 3D effect goes away. Okay, so this is not a real effect. This is not, uh, does not give profound new meaning to magnetism. It is uh, standard optics. It is standard magnetism. Um, there, is, there is nothing uh, new going on here that we didn't already know before. It just took us a while to figure it out. Another problem I have with this paper has to do with this figure here. And so uh, basically what he's saying is, um, so let's just read, I'm concerned about this, uh, this figure here, figure B. So in figure B, he says, he's this a strong bar neodymium magnet held at a distance with its poles facing down to the ferro lens. He says the toroidal geometry of the quantum field of the pole is revealed without interlacing lines. Oh yeah. So this is, has to do with interlacing lines. So basically he's saying that uh, here you can see the interlacing lines and they kind of look flat, but here you can see the interlacing lines and it kind of looks like, uh, it looks more 3D, like a 3D torus, because some of the lines look like they are under uh, these lines. So these lines look bright and these lines look dim. And because, uh, and he is holding the magnet in a certain orientation, okay? He's holding, so instead of the magnet being flat on the magnet where you don't really see um, that toroidal shape, uh, when he holds the magnet in this orientation, uh, you see that some lines look brighter, it looks like some lines are under, and it looks more like a, like a torus, maybe a torus knot or a torus structure. Okay, so I uh, was able to simulate that. I was able to simulate that. And uh, so what I did was I created a simulation where I placed the magnet in a similar orientation uh, to the uh, ferro lens as he did in his experiment in this, uh, in this figure here. I don't believe he actually did this. I think somebody else did this, but uh, anyways. So here is my simulation of, of this scenario here with the magnet uh, hovering above and on an angle exactly like what he is doing here and I was able to reproduce the having brighter lines on top and darker lines underneath giving that sort of torus effect that he is saying um, that he is talking about here so he is saying that this has uh, some uh, special significance in his paper and I'm saying that it doesn't have any special significance because I am able to replicate that effect using uh, AB's uh, simulation, which is only simulating reflections off the nanoparticles as they align uh, when you place the magnet in the field of view. Okay, so that is another, uh, what I'm going to call a, a misinterpretation, a misunderstanding, a misconception that is presented in this paper that passed peer review. He also makes another uh, mistake in uh, figure eight. Okay, in figure eight, he's taking this figure, which I believe he got from, um, from Ferrocell.us um, website. 
I don't think he created this image himself, but he is analyzing this image and he, and, uh, he identifies this as the block region again, mistakenly, but that is not the problem I'm having with this figure. So let's read what he has to say. So he, he says the total quantum field outline geometry of a dipole magnet is revealed here by the ferro lens. So he is um, calling this a quantum field. Again, this is not a field. Um, this is not directly a field. Uh, it is maybe indirectly a field. It is an indirect um, projection of the field of the light reflecting off the nanoparticles that self-organize into uh, iron filing-like patterns when you place a magnet on the ferro lens. So um, he, what he is saying here is that so we can clearly see the inner part of the photo that where the field consists of two separate distinct magnetic flux bubbles. So he's calling these two bubbles magnetic flux bubbles, okay, and uh, each at either pole of the magnet placed back to back at almost tangent to the middle of the magnet where the block wall region, there's no block wall in the permanent magnet, but where the block uh, field is located and separating the two bubbles. Okay, so he is making up some physics based on some his ideas, which are which are based on incorrect information about the block wall, and incorrect understanding of magnetism in general, in my opinion. Okay, so uh, on top of the ferro lens is a cylinder magnet. Actually, it's not a cylinder magnet, but um, it is a bar magnet. But that's a moot point. Uh, it's placed uh, so a small uh, lamp is is placed underneath. Um, so he said a small incandescent lamp with a diameter smaller than the diameter of the magnet was placed directly under the ferro lens and uh, almost in contact with the center. So light from a small lamp, because it's very close proximity to the magnet, is mostly blocked by the magnet's mass and is strongly scattered sideways to the periphery of the lens, revealing thereby the outline of the magnet's quantum, the magnet's quantum dipole field. So he is calling this a quantum dipole field, which, um, which it is not. Okay, This photograph was taken with the aid of uh, some custom apparatus, which he describes here. And then he talks about how the light also lights up the outer ring of the ferro lens. Um, but uh, this image here, so he made up a lot of stuff about quantum dipole fields and um, how this proves that his theory about quantum dipole fields. But in reality, I was able to easily reproduce this image, um, which I will show you in a second. So here is an image that I previously showed on my community section. Um, here is the image uh, that Emmanuel shows in his paper, which I actually got from the ferrocell.us website. Uh, so he actually just lifted an image from the ferrocell um, website, and um, actually I don't think he even um, referenced them in his paper. But, uh, so I was able to easily simulate this. I took the magnet, uh, the shape of the magnet, and uh, reproduced uh, and put those parameters into the simulation. And I was able to reproduce these two lobes that Emmanuel is talking about in his paper using the very simple simulation where we're simulating lights reflecting off the nanoparticles that self-organize into um, iron filing like patterns in the presence of a magnet. So clearly you can see that um, that we are able to reproduce uh, using standard physics, standard magnetism, standard optics, uh, reproduce these two lobes without introducing any new concepts that um, maybe sound nice, maybe you know a quantum field of a magnet kind of sounds cool, but um, this is not what's going on in this situation right here. And, uh, and there are a couple of other figures in this paper that I know that Emmanuel did not create himself. Um, this figure here on the right is from uh, Ken Wheeler's book, Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism. If you download that book and go to page 137, 
you're going to find exactly this figure. And nowhere in this paper does Emmanuel give credit to and or an acknowledgement of uh, this figure. He does not reference this figure whatsoever. And uh, there's another figure in here. Uh, I don't think any, I don't think he created any of these figures. Um, but this one here I recognized from, um, from this YouTube channel here, UFO Politics. Uh, there's uh, 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 some videos called Enlightened Magnetism. And uh, you can see right here, uh, there is a figure that looks exactly like the one from Emmanuel's paper. I know for a fact that he lifted this figure from this video or from one of one of these videos and put it in his paper without referencing uh, this person whatsoever. And so uh, in terms of peer review, that is totally not cool. It's totally not cool. And so I don't have any respect for this paper whatsoever. Um, it's based on falsehoods. It's based on, um, you know, taking other people's ideas, like some ideas from Ken and uh, and other people and Tim Vanderelli. I'm sure, that, you know, I know most of these images, a lot of them came from other people and not from him. And um, he just basically slapped a bunch of stuff together and put a paper together and he got um, it accepted uh, to a, uh, a, a journal. And so, um, so that's, you know, peer review is broken. Peer review is broken, in my opinion. I think peer review is also uh, grossly misunderstood because people think, oh, I got through peer review, therefore what I'm saying is true and correct and good. And that is um, patently not true. That is not the case. Um, lots of things get through peer review. Uh, without uh, proper scrutiny and so um, so this is a problem it's a problem in terms of um, people's perceptions of peer review and it is also a problem because misinformation can get out there and perpetuated um, and cause a lot of problems so so that's it that's all I'm going to do for today and um, I hope you guys uh, have a good holiday and um, and well I'll be back